we today? Uh, what you need to know about everything that's done in class today, except my ad libs, will come from these two books that uh, are your major texts. That is, Religion in the Bible by Ian Barber, and then the uh, volume on God and Nature, which contains a number of essays. And what we're going to do today, basically, is to go from nature's God toward the God of the gaps. In other words, as we did, uh, as we did medieval theology, we uh, came to understand the meaning of the idea that theology for the medieval people was the queen of the sciences. And so there wouldn't be any science that escaped the hegemony of uh, theology. But uh, there was still a distinction, even in medieval times, between, uh, between uh, the idea of revelation in the Bible and the idea of revelation in nature. But there wasn't any idea that these two were just totally separate realms in which, uh, uh, in which, uh, you, which you had to have distinct kinds of people to operate in. From the perspective of the medieval synthesis, uh, an educated person, since that's what the Christian universities were built to do, was to educate people in primarily in theology and then in the other sciences. An educated person would not have divided theology from science or revelation from the revelation in nature uh, as it came to be done. But as we moved into the scientific revolution, we noticed that there came to be more emphasis on nature's God. That is, that we, in order to understand uh, nature, which was the second book of God, you couldn't do that by reading the Bible, which was the first book of God. You had to do that by reading nature itself. And as people began to read nature itself in a more systematic and methodological way, you had more emphasis on the God of nature, nature's God. And you find out about nature's God by studying nature. You find out about things that uh, God has revealed through his word by studying the Bible. Well, nature's God continues to have a, a very strong grip on the 18th century, as we're going to see by looking at Kepler and, and uh, Newton and folks like that. But eventually, because of the way thought started to develop in the 18th century, by the end of the 18th century, you were going to get to the position of having the God of the gaps. And the God of the gaps is not nearly as strong a God as the God of nature. Why is that? What's the difference between nature's God and the God of the gaps? Anybody want to throw something out? Nature's God is in complete control of everything. In other words, the mechanistic scientist like, uh, like Newton still had a very, an extremely strong God. He was still in control of everything. He had made everything, and there's nothing that was made that wasn't made by him. But in this mechanism that Newton developed, in this mechanistic view of the earth and the universe that Newton developed, uh, he had some gaps. From his perspective, the, the, op the universe operated on very mechanical, natural law. But he still didn't have the mathematics to completely explain every operation within the universe. And so he still kind of had the idea back in his mind that every once in a while, the accumulation of errors in the system, God had to kind of reach down and go boop, boop, and tap things back the way they belong. And that produced the basis for what was later called the God of the gaps. In other words, you don't need God to explain anything going on in nature anymore, except the few things that you can't explain fully through natural law. Well, as soon as uh, Laplace and other people explain these things fully through natural law, then what happens to the God of the gaps? He disappears. He goes off somewhere, <laughs> and he's not there anymore. And so everything is operating purely on the basis of mechanical law. 
And so from having God completely and absolutely in control of the whole shebang, by the time you get to the end of the 18th century, you have God just kind of as an interested onlooker. He started everything off, but uh, he doesn't have any work to do now. He's kind of a retired creator. And uh, uh, then from that, from the God of the gaps, would also come the uh, God who does not exist. Because if you don't have if you don't have a need for God, unless he just kind of fills in scientific gaps, then you don't have a need for God at all. Yes. Was that where the emergence of deism was? Yes. The whole clockwork theory. Deism, deism, was based. It's the philosophical, it's the philosophical theology of Newtonianism. In other words, if uh, if the universe is like a clock that has been created sometime in the past out of nothing. I mean, these people were creationists. They believed that God created the world out of nothing. But once it was created, he set in motion the earth in terms of natural law. But uh, uh, this view eventually became mechanistic, that is, mechanical. Now, Newton was not completely mechanistic himself. In fact, he believed that the law of gravity had to be kept in place by God. In other words, it, it, for him, God was not a retired author or a retired creator. Even the law of gravity could be explained by Newton only in terms of the power of God. But since natural, since these laws of nature were now put in place, it was a short drift then from believing that God created all the na laws of nature and kept them operating to the belief that laws of nature meant that you didn't need God to keep things operating, because the laws of nature themselves would do it. But as we saw last time, uh, this certainly wasn't yet the view of the scientific revolutionists. That is, the revolutionaries of modern science were all Christians, and they were all theologians, and they all inclined to believe that you could not understand God or science without without belief in, you couldn't understand science at all without belief in God. You couldn't understand the nature of reality without belief in God. And the cosmos was part of the reality that God created. Um, but as Galileo said, uh, and this is what you read in his letter to the Grand Duchess, uh, you st in order to understand nature, you don't study the Bible. You study nature. So he's beginning to make a differentiation there. But it's not a differentiation between God and nature. It's a differentiation. Uh, it's not a differentiation between uh, 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 atheism and theism. It's a differentiation within theism, within Christianity, in fact, with how you relate to different realities. So he said, "I would say here's something that w that was heard from an ecclesiastic of the most eminent degree, that the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven." not how heaven goes. Speaking of how you interpret the Bible, you do not interpret the Bible, you, not, you, do, you do not understand nature by interpreting the Bible. You understand nature by interpreting nature. But he's obviously not getting rid of the Bible. John Calvin uh, had basically the same perspective. Astronomers investigate with great labor whatever the sagacity of the human mind can comprehend. This study is not to be reprobated. Reprobate was a good word for Calvin. This study was not to be reprobated, nor this science to be condemned, because some frantic persons are wont to boldly reject whatever is unknown to them. In other words, uh, he's kind of getting on some of his Calvinist uh, uh, parishioners who are very, uh, uh, who jump at the chance of condemning anything that modern science puts forth for belief. He says these people are frantic and we should allow astronomers to do what they're supposed to do. For astronomy is not only pleasant but also very useful to be known. It cannot be denied that this art unfolds the admirable wisdom of God. So you have a distinction here between the scripture as the revealed knowledge of God and nature But you do not have, as yet, a distinction between science completely 
and theology. Theology still reigns. In other words, from... Uh, uh, and theology is not the same thing as scriptural interpretation. That's one of the problems that we might have in, in understanding this. Um, because Galileo believed that you should not interpret nature by scripture did not, does not mean that he doubted, therefore, the authority of scripture, that the scripture were, was totally authoritative in its area, in its realm. But nature and the study of nature was totally, totally authoritative in its realm. But since God was over the whole thing, and each of these was a book of God, then there as yet had not been a separation totally between theology and science. And by the end of uh, the 18th century, this separation had begun. But this was long after the deaths of the revolutionaries of modern science. Martin Luther had said basically the same thing uh, in terms of uh, his theology, or the same thing in terms of his view of nature as he had said about his view of salvation. The righteousness of faith, which God imputes to us through Christ without works, is neither political, nor ceremonial, nor legal, nor works righteousness, but is quite the opposite. It is merely passive righteousness, while all others listed above are active. And so from Luther's perspective, you could go from his doctrine of salvation to his doctrine of the world. The world in the same way was completely passive. It's the absolute creation of God. It contains no energy within itself. All of its energy and all of its activity come from the creative activity of God. And, uh, and, and this, this, continues in, in, uh, this continues in Newton. All of the activity, all of the creative power in the universe, even from Newton's perspective, comes from God. Now, in chapter 8 of this God and Nature, uh, you have the discussion of the rise of science and the decline of Orthodox Christianity. That's what we're talking about when we're going from uh, nature's God to the God of the gaps. We're looking at the decline of Orthodox Christianity. And in order to do that, uh -oh. maybe if I punch the right button, I'll get to the place I'm going to. Okay, Johannes Kepler. Kepler, we know, was one of the other revolutionaries of modern science that we don't hear that much about. We hear, hear about Galileo, but we don't hear much about Kepler. But Kepler, of course, is one who refined the Copernican view and uh, uh, enabled the, the, the Copernican view to be more acceptable even to uh, religious people. Uh, and I use the word religious people in quotations because all of these people were religious people. But Kepler is called the Christian cosmologist. In other words, when you get to Kepler, you still haven't left Christianity to go to something else. You're still Christian. Kepler said, the Holy Father, this is a prayer, Holy Father, preserve us in the harmony of our mutual love so that we may be one even as you with your Son, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit are one. And as you have through the gentle bonds of harmony made all your works one. And from the renewed concord of your people let the body of your church on earth be built from harmonies as you have constructed the heavens themselves. You remember we talked about how important it was to understand Anselm in the context of his argument for the existence of God being in the middle of a prayer. Kepler's study of science is in the middle of a prayer. All his philosophical description of what, of what characterizes the cosmos or the universe is in the middle of prayer. For the sphere, which is the image of God the Creator and the archetype of the world, there are three regions. Now remember this uh, concept of the sphere. The universe is a, as a sphere. And, uh, and uh, Kepler doesn't give up that image. He changes it to a Copernican image because in the Ptolemaic image, the sphere surrounded as its center what? What is the center of the sphere? The earth. Well, Kepler... Uh, still conceives of the sphere as a very potent way of visualizing the nature of the cosmos. Uh, 
But by the time he has accepted Copernicus, then the center of the sphere becomes God the Father. And what represents God the Father? The Son. So there are three regions, symbols of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. The center, a symbol of the Father. The surface, a symbol of the Son. And the in intermediate space of the Holy Ghost. We see these people couldn't, couldn't stop talking about their theology. Uh, it never dawned on them to write a book of science in which you didn't talk about theology. So there has not yet been this uh, fatal uh, letting go of God and talking, ju ju talking just about the laws of nature and talking about the mechanical operations of the universe. Uh, they weren't about to let go of God. In fact, Kepler was so religious that he was able to maintain his Christian faith even though he was unorthodox on some things that made him unacceptable to any major Christian denomination. But, uh, uh, but that didn't, that didn't uh, stop him from being extremely intense and pious in his understanding of the Christian faith. Uh, sometimes uh, I, get the, uh, I get the impression uh, from... Uh, some modern interpreters that if these guys had just had an opportunity to get out from under the authority of the church, they would have just become agnostics or skeptics or atheists immediately. Well, Kepler is an example of the fact that he was not under the authority of any church because no church would have him. He was a Lutheran, but uh, he was not orthodox enough for the Lutheran. But he was obviously uh, quite religious, quite pious, and quite orthodox enough for uh, certainly most, uh, most modern Christians. He was a Trinitarian. Now when you get to uh, Newton, you start to leave Trinitarianism and go to Unitarianism. And there is even more of a problem with the traditional church. But the fact that these people were not in tune with the traditional church uh, had no tendency to separate them from their uh, emphasis on theology. So too, this is Kepler, so too, just as many principal parts of the world have been made, the different parts in the different regions of the sphere, the sun is the center, the sphere of the fixed stars on the surface, and lastly, the planetary system in the region of intermediate between the sun and the fixed stars. So, um, now, I don't know of even any fundamentalist theologian these days who would talk this way about nature. And so we, we certainly haven't gone from uh, being a revolutionary of modern science to uh, being skeptical about the existence of God or even the uh, truth of uh, Christianity as they understood it. Hence the sun is a certain body in which resides that faculty which we call light, God light, of communicating itself to all things. For this reason alone, its rightful place is the middle point and center of the whole world so that it may diffuse itself perpetually and uniformly throughout the universe. All other beings that share in light imitate the sun. You might even say that Kepler um, would have, uh, if he had known what he knew at, at the time he lived, he would have objected to the, uh, the earth being considered the center of the universe, not just on scientific grounds, but on theological grounds. And if you remember when I talked about the, uh, the Middle Ages, I said that was really a, 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 prob a, ten a problem of tension in middle, mid medieval thinkers because they really did believe that God was the center of the universe. They didn't really believe the earth was the center of the universe. And so the fact that they had accepted Aristotle's view that the earth was the center of the universe uh, actually presented a problem. That problem was eventually solved by Copernicus and then by Kepler and uh, Brahe and uh, Newton and so forth. But uh, the problem was not solved by kicking God out of the universe. The problem was solved by putting God back in the center of the universe. Now, when we come to René Descartes, uh, he's called in your book the reluctant skeptic. And what does it mean that he's a reluct reluctant skeptic? Well, he has uh, imbibed the mechanism, the mechanical view of the universe, 
from Newton and has uh, intensified it so that he does not believe that there's any room in Christian theology, much less in science, for miracles. Now, he's interested in what is, what's preservable in Christian theology because he is a Roman Catholic and he wants to be considered an Orthodox Roman Catholic. Uh, it's hard for him to be considered a Ro an Orthodox Roman Catholic when he finally does away with miracles, but he's trying to explain miracles uh, that the church holds as simply, uh, as, as simply inevitable consequences of the creation that God made. So he says, at the same time, recalling my insignificance, I affirm nothing but submit all these opinions to the authority of the Catholic Church and to the judgment of the more sage. In other words, he has, he has of course, Galileo in mind. And uh, uh, it was possible for him to not have been a Roman Catholic, but it wasn't, he, he, he didn't intend to take that option. He still wanted to remain a Roman Catholic. But however skeptical he got of how you know things, he still gave all final authority to the Roman Church. And uh, even uh, uh, Kepler and people like that didn't go that far. If God did not reveal himself to Descartes, now this is uh, Ian Barber talking, if God did not reveal himself to Descartes in the ordered structure of the uh, cosmos, he did reveal himself in the ordered regularity of phenomena. In other words, uh, uh, you're, you're turning corner here because from the perspective of uh, the Bible and revealed authority, God revealed himself preeminently through miraculous events. But in Descartes, um, since he had imbibed the mechanism, God is revealing himself not through miraculous events, but through the regularity of phenomena. From such came a recognition of law, but not a sense of worship and wonder. One of the goals of his natural philosophy was the abolition of wonder by displaying the physical necessity of supposed marvels, marvels, the physical necessity of miracles and marvels. Well, obviously, this is a new way of looking at the Christian faith. And Descartes is usually credited by most modern theologians as, as uh, uh, creating the, the most uh, fatal division in Christian thought. Uh, Descartes, for instance, believed in the immortality of the soul, but the, the, immortal, the immortal soul obviously was a co completely different reality and not really integrally connected with the uh, mechanics of the universe. And so um, his concept of the soul is sometimes called the ghost in the machine. That is, uh, a human being is a machine. Uh, and a machine obviously... Uh, will operate on the basis of natural laws, but in order for a human machine to operate in a human way, it has to have a kind of a ghost inside of it. And uh, if I remember correctly, somebody uh, uh, asked him where the soul was, and he, spe he speculated that it was in the pineal gland. Well, wherever the soul is for Descartes, it is a different thing what, whatsoever. It, it's, it's a very different thing from nature itself. And so in this way, he, he divided nature and supernature in such a way that eventually uh, 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 Christians would, uh, uh, that, that is the descendants of Christians, would either tend toward a hyper-supernaturalism or a hyper-naturalism based on which, way, which direction they took from Descartes. And uh, the, the revival, in fact, of this... Uh, doctrine of the immortality of the soul, a lot of people, a lot of Christians today, when they speak of the immortal soul, are actually speaking in a Cartesian way, not in a biblical way at all. First of all, the uh, expression immortal soul is not found in the Bible. And so if you're going to have a doctrine of immortal soul, uh, I guess Descartes is one that you can choose. But, uh, but this just completely divided uh, reality into nature and supernature. And uh, supernature had nothing to do with the way that uh, nature operated except in terms of the human being. For we understand it to be a perfection in God 
not only that he is in himself immutable, but also that he acts in a manner as constant and, and as immutable as possible. Now again, that's a philosophical statement. That's not a scientific statement. But during this period, uh, you're, getting into the, you're, you're getting into the period when people are not really differentiating between philosophical statements and scientific statements. If, for instance, that you say, if, for instance, you say that the that the universe or the cosmos is a giant machine, that's a philosophical statement. That's not a scientific statement. It's a statement drawn from your imagination. In other words, you are using a machine as an analogy for understanding the world. As we're going to see later, the Romantics reacted very negatively toward that idea because they wanted to think of the of the universe not as a machine but as a, more of a living organism. And so that also arises in the 18th century. So that, that's, that is, the universe is so immutable, so that with the sole exception of those instances which the evidence of experience or divine revelation makes certain, such as the immortality of the human soul, or which we perceive or believe to have been brought about without any change in the Creator, we must not admit any other alterations in His acts lest any inconsistency be thence inferred in God himself. Well, this basically uh, uh, rules God completely out of the gaps. Now, Isaac Newton, we've already looked at, is the foe of irrationality, according to this uh, text. And uh, we've quoted his statement. This most beautiful system of the sun, the planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. He is eternal and infinite, omnipotent and omniscient. That is, his duration reaches from eternity to eternity, his presence from infinity to infinity, he governs all things and knows all things that, that are or can be done. We know him by his most wise and excellent contrivances of things and final causes. We admire him for his per perfections, but we reverence and adore him on the account of his dominion. For we adore him as his servants and a God without dominion, providence, providence and final causes is nothing else but fate and nature. And uh, that's one thing that uh, Newton is very careful to want to avoid, a fatalism or a complete naturalism. Okay, does anybody have a reaction or comment? I've just been going on here. Newton continues, blind metaphysical necessity, which is certainly the same always and everywhere, could produce no variety of things. That's the passivity of, of creation, as Luther believed. It could produce no variety of things. All that diversity of natural things which we find suited to different times and places could arise from nothing but the ideas of will and will of a being necessarily existing. Okay, do you, do, you, do you feel the movement now from, uh, from the uh, theology is the queen of the sciences and science, natural sciences subordinated, subordinated to the queen of the sciences to the, to, the, to the idea of the two books of creation so that uh, neither is subordinated to the other but both are of equal value. And this is especially this especially comes out in Kepler. Um, in fact, Kepler, to a certain extent, um, moves a little bit toward the the predominant role of nature as the revelation of God. But it's still a revelation of God either way you go. And uh, and uh, and so as this uh, as nature becomes the revelation of God and. Uh, as nature becomes the revelation of God primarily through its laws of, mo laws of nature and through its regularities, uh, 
then you uh, cease to need uh, the action of God, uh, according to some people, except to kind of correct deficiencies in the laws of nature. That would not have been uh, Newton's view, but that would be the view that came out of uh, some people who were convinced by Newton of the mechanical nature of the universe. Okay, in the, in the philosophical realm of the 18th century, we need to talk primarily about people like Hume and Kant. Many thinkers of the Enlightenment wanted to extend to all problems the methods that had been so successful in physics. Newtonian physics was, t was taken as the model not only for our other natural sciences, but also for scientific solutions to the problems of society. In uh, Hume, uh, and this again is uh, a quotation from uh, Barber, not Hume, Hume dwelt on the empirical side of science and concluded that any idea that cannot be traced to sense data is not of significance, it's without significance. For him, as for reason positivist, empirical verification is the criterion of all knowledge. Uh, a uh, very important philosophical movement, if you haven't studied your philosophy, one, very important philosophical movement in the 20th century is the movement of logical positivism. And uh, this is the application in 20th century thought of, of Hume's basic premise, that unless something is, uh, is uh, scientifically verifiable, it is not true, it is not knowledge, it is not a, uh, it is not a fact. Uh, Christianity has always um, assumed, at least underlying its theology, that there are some things that are not empirically verifiable. There are some things that are only verifiable in some other way. Most theologians today would talk about things being verifiable eschatologically. In other words, uh, how can you know that God is uh, moving towards some eschatological goal? Well, you can't obviously verify that empirically. You can only verify that eschatologically. In other words, you won't know it, it's, that it's happening until it happens. And so uh, uh, verification is a very important criteria in uh, modern philosophy and in modern science. And uh, from Hume's perspective, the only possible uh, criterion for something that you can actually call knowledge is that it's empirically verifiable. Kant, on the other hand, maintained that the human mind supplies crucial conceptual categories in the inter interpretation of sense data. In other words, that you know things because of the structure of the mind rather than, uh, rather than empirical data having kind of knowledge in itself that you perceive or that you uh, get out of it. But Kant also has the problem or pre presents the problem for Christian theology of dividing just kind of absolutely between theology and science. For Kant, science and religion occupy entirely different spheres and are given distinct functions which are so adjusted that they need never conflict. Now, this has become, this position of the relationship between religion and science has become kind of the orthodox position of modern, uh, of modern naturalistic scientists or modern scientists who who are uh, intent on preserving the, natural, the naturalistic methodology. That is, there is no use even mentioning God 
are mentioning any concept of design in studying science. It's a fruitless thing to do. And uh, whether or not they know that they got this uh, uh, initially from Kant, uh, it depends on the scientist, I guess. But uh, this, of course, is the, is the main thesis of Gould's book, Stephen Jay Gould's book that I've, that I've asked you to read called The Rock of Ages, that religion and science occupy entirely different spheres and never the twain shall meet. And so any attempt by any modern theologian to say anything close to what Newton would have said or what Kepler would have said uh, then becomes an absolute no-no because of the... Uh, because of the great philosophical divide that Kant represents. And so creationists, of course, are anathema. Creationists argue that, that you can actually learn from science that, uh, that, the, that the earth had to be created by a deity. You could learn from science that uh, God is of a certain nature and so forth. And uh, 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 even modern... Uh, developers of the idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, design, that is, that you can see design in nature, even if you can't prove by nature that the Christian God is the God, you can prove by nature that, the, that nature is designed. And this, uh, from the perspective of Gould, is a crossing over of the barrier that was established by Kant. Religion has to be defined one way, Science has to define one way, and they have to be defined so that religion can say nothing about science, and science can say nothing about religion. And that's kind of the uh, modus operandi of a great many uh, scientists and a great many theologians who want to give science all of the uh, leeway that they can give them. There is, uh, a, there is a movement today on the part of both conservative theologians and more liberal theologians to try to see if there may be some better way to talk about the relationship between religion and science. Because in effect what this does is put religion in a place where it religion is in charge of no knowledge whatever. The only knowledge that's uh, available science is in charge of. And that's basically Gould's position. Well, that really doesn't uh, that really doesn't suit many theologians very well because what that means is that is Gould is beginning by asserting that religion has its own sphere and has its own teaching authority. Uh, science has its own fear, sphere, its own teaching authority. But guess what? Guess who determines the definition of religion? <laughs> the scientist does. The scientist determines the, the definition of religion because he, he argues and uh, he argues that religion can have nothing to do with any explanations that have to do with science and religion can have nothing to do with anything that can really be called knowledge. Well, uh, a theologian might say, pardon me, but can't I define religion? <laughs> since, <laughs> since I'm the one over here in this sphere and you're over in that sphere, can I define religion so that religion actually does deal with some kinds of knowledge? It's not maybe empirically verifiable, but it's, but it's verifiable through experience. Uh, it's verifiable through some other way, intuition, whatever. Or it's eschatologically verifiable. In other words, uh, you obviously can't empirically verify that there is a going to be a continuing relationship of human beings to God beyond death. That's only eschatologically verifiable. And anyone who tries to empirically verify it, as a lot of people are doing today with near-death experiences and so forth, um, from, most theolo from most theological perspectives, uh, that's, that is the improper mixing of science and theology. But uh, it's not improper to still assume that theology does deal with knowledge. It's just not empirically verifiable knowledge. It's eschatologically verifiable. Anybody have a, yeah? The, um, the way that things had progressed in the thinking of the scientists of the time or whatever, um, 
what was there a specific discovery, specific thing that happened that made this change of thought, or was it just over time that did they quit reading what the uh, the religious statements of the scientists before, or what was that? Uh, you act like you've been primed to feed into our next class, because that's exactly what we're going to deal with. The uh, the fact of the matter is, and this is this is what I'm going to use W. T. Stace for. Unfortunately, W. T. Stace is out of print, but uh, he does the best job of uh, explaining this transition between the age of faith and the age of skepticism. And he does it, and we're going to do this more thoroughly next week. He does it by listing by by simply describing in simple terms what the revolutionary what the revolutionaries of modern science actually discovered and you can list them and they're you know they're just about five things that the revolutionary science uh, revolutionaries of modern science discovered that people didn't already know before and then after listing them he says now which one of those which one of those if you believe means there is no god well, the answer, of course, is that that uh, you can believe all four of the all four or five of the major discoveries of the revolutionaries of modern science, and still believe in God, because there's no logical tendency for anything that science has discovered, has has discovered, will discover, or can discover, that will have the least logical tendency to either prove or disprove the existence of God. And so that's basically what we're building up to. In other words, if a modern scientist, uh, or if a, of an 18th century scientist or a 19th century scientist doesn't believe in God, it has nothing logically to do with what science has discovered. It has a great deal to do with the psychology of what has been discovered. In other words, uh, you can think of the age of skepticism as an age of maturing and progress on the part of the human mind, or you can think of it as an adolescent reaction on the part of the European mind. And uh, those, are the, those are kind of the things that we'll be looking at uh, toward the middle of this semester, toward the end of this semester. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the answer to your question is, are you talking logically or are you talking psychologically? If you're talking logically, there's nothing that anybody discovered in the scientific revolution that should logically lead to the belief that God does not exist, or even that God is not in control of the universe. But uh, psychologically, it led to that belief. The God of the gaps, for instance, led to that belief. Because if you, if you have a God who is in control of everything, has to be in control of everything because the world is passive, as Luther and Newton both believed, then if you explain everything to the point where God's kind of loose loosened his grip and here's the world and God's kind of loosened his grip on it except every once in a while there's an accumulation of, uh, of uh, misadventures here in nature and so God has to kind of reach in and tap the planets back in the line. That was, that, that's what Newton left for scientists. Uh, he had everything explained except that uh, his explanation could not explain the movements of the planets in a perfect enough way to keep the planets moving simply on mechanistic terms. So even he postulated that perhaps God, this was the only answer he knew, was that God kind of reached back in and tapped it. Well, already you've got God's, uh, God has lost his grip on the universe. He's just kind of sitting out here tapping things. When somebody finds out how that, uh, how that gap can be filled scientifically, then God has completely lost his grip on the universe. And a God who has completely lost his grip on the universe first becomes a deistic God. That is, he's a God that probably got everything started in the first place, but he doesn't have anything to do anymore. And if you've got a God that doesn't have anything to do anymore, then basically what you're developing is a totally secular view of the universe. And if you have a totally secular view of the universe, then religion can be related to uh, an area which does not include any important knowledge. That's methodological naturalism. Religion doesn't include any important knowledge. 
Now, methodological naturalism doesn't necessarily produce atheism, but uh, it can because it also produces philosophical naturalism. And that's the naturalism that I was talking about when I, the first, remember the first quote I put on the screen at the first of this course, the quote by, by um, Carl Sagan, the cosmos is all there is, all there ever has been, all there ever will be. And that's the first sentence in Carl Sagan's science book. And so I don't know whether he intended that to be considered to be a scientific statement, but whether he intended it to be or not, it is not a scientific statement. It's a philosophical statement. It's a statement of philosophical naturalism. Now, all philosophical naturalists obviously will be methodological naturalists. But not all methodological naturalists are philosophical naturalists. For instance, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of a, of a scientist that, whose name you might know, a practical scientist, say, Werner von Braun. He was a methodological naturalist, and because he was a methodological naturalist, he was able to produce uh, some incredibly uh, important uh, progress in the fields of rockets and things like that. But he was a Christian fundamentalist, and so he obviously wasn't a philosophical naturalist. He wasn't a philosophical naturalist. So those are the kinds of uh, relationships we're talking about. Now that probably confused more than it helped, but... At least it got some things out on the table. I, I do need to kind of stop here and encourage the students that are in this course because I realize, I've realized more as we've gone along, that the reading that is available for this course uh, would make a good graduate course. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it would make a good graduate course, and I realize that. And, uh, and so I'm not really expecting you to do a graduate course here. And so if you are feeling totally overburdened by the reading and by the, by the uh, lectures, I want you to understand, you're, you're shaking your head, yes, you feel totally overburdened. I want you to understand that you shouldn't feel overburdened. As of today, in fact, I can tell you that everybody in here has an A. And you're going to have to, <laughs> you're going to have to do a little work to get less than an A. But some of you will manage, I'm sure. But uh, the purpose of all this reading and the purpose of everything that I'm putting out in class is not that you have to take it in and it has to kind of stay there, you know. You can't put cotton balls in, your, in one ear so it won't go out the other ear. You're not going to be regurgitating this back on any exam. What I'm trying to do is just give, give you as much information as I can so that you can uh, after a while, the vision can become a little clearer. And this question you ask uh, is very helpful in that regard. Any other questions? I don't want my students, in other words, to be scared to death. Uh, but sometimes I talk in such a way that maybe scares them to death. But uh, I, I, do, I do understand education enough to know that uh, what I've said here today is the result of, uh, it may be right or it may be wrong, I'm not, I'm not making any final judgment on that, but it's the result of years and years and years of, of reading and study and reflection. And so that's kind of the object of having a teacher is uh, so that he can put out some of the stuff that some of it you'll catch and some of it you won't catch and it may be years before you fill out the entire thing. But uh, this course is supposed to get you started on that. Yes? Uh, you were talking about these um, four or five scientific discoveries that, that, uh, that you said uh, didn't logically lead to a uh, yeah. little belief of a non-existence of God. Yeah. But uh, not knowing what they were, since we're not going into detail, uh, well, would, they, would they lead to a, uh, a, a sort of allowing people to not believe in God in, in that it became no longer necessary for God to, enter, uh, to be a, a part of these discoveries? Oh, people or? were allowed not to believe in God during the medieval period. There, 
Well, yes, they were. You, uh, we have the concept. We have the concept that uh, the medieval period was just one giant uh, monolithic thing. There were some people uh, who became Orthodox in the medieval period who were very closely related politically and otherwise to the uh, to the hierarchy of the church. And uh, the more closely they were related to the hierarchy of the church, the more trouble they got into if they were unorthodox. But there were, there were hundreds of thousands of people during the Middle Ages who were, who were Wicca, pagans. There were, there were thousands of people during the Middle Ages that were proto-Protestants. That is, they, they accepted nothing of the Roman Catholic Church or the Roman Catholic hierarchy. There were, uh, when Christianity first began, uh, the, uh, the Christian uh, apologists and theologians actually developed their theology uh, in the opposition of skeptics and uh, other folks that uh, did not accept the Christian faith. So, um, uh, you're correct in your, in your vision of the fact that some people got in bad trouble during the Middle Ages for not being orthodox. But most of the unorthodox people did not get in any trouble in the Middle Ages. Most of them weren't even available to the, uh, to the hierarchy of the Middle Ages. Uh, a few years ago, um, a song came out by a Belgian nun. A Belgian nun. Uh, and uh, the name of the song was Dominique. Any of you remember that song? Any of you old enough to remember that song? Dominique, Niki, Niki. Beautiful, cute little song. And, uh, but when they translated it into English, they said, Dominique was out in the woodlands fighting sin like everything. Well, that's a wonderful, cute little English translation, but the French says that Dominique was out in the woods fighting the Albigenses like everything. And who were the Albigenses? They were a fairly significant group of people who did not accept the Roman authority. And every once in a while, the Roman church would go out and try to round them up, but they, there was not any possibility of rounding them all up. And so the Albigenses still have uh, uh, descendants in Spain. So uh, the, the, the concept of the Middle Ages being a monolithic thing, it, it's, it, the problem with history is it's just written... Uh, it, the only thing we know about history is is that is is what the historians write, <laughs> so to speak, and uh, and all of the historians in the Middle Ages were Catholics, Roman Catholics, and so uh, they point out these uh, they point out these uh, heretics and uh, and what happened to some of them, but in terms of um, the High Middle Ages, this was really a fairly open intellectual uh, arena during the High Middle Ages. Um, if Thomas Aquinas, for instance, had been around at the time of uh, Luther, he probably would have been condemned uh, as well as Luther was. Uh, in fact, he was condemned. He was condemned, uh, he was condemned in, the, uh, that is, his Aristotelianism was condemned before he became an Aristotelian, and then it was condemned after he became an Aristotelian. But uh, that didn't affect him very much because his students uh, kind, of, kind of formed a circle around him and protected him from, from some of the uh, angry hierarchy. Um, the point I'm making is that, uh, is that uh, there is no monolithic Middle Ages. And... Uh, there is plenty of trash in the Middle Ages. There's plenty of persecution. There's plenty of, uh, of harassment of unorthodox people. But the Roman Catholic Church was not powerful enough to harass all unorthodox people, including atheists. So it's possible... Uh, uh, well, Kepler is an example of... Uh, of someone who uh, would rather have been in good with the major Christian denominations, but he just wasn't. But it didn't affect his. Uh, he didn't. It, it didn't affect the fact that he continued to remain a Christian. <laughs>
Whereas on the other hand, uh, somebody like uh, Laplace uh, might have the tendency to become agnostic, even though he continued to be a Roman Catholic. Now, <laughs> back to your question about the things that, uh, that the revolutionaries of modern science figured out. One of them was the earth goes around the sun. The sun does not go around the earth. Now, what kind of a proof is that that God does not exist? Another of the great discoveries of the revolution is modern science, is the modern law of motion. In other words, uh, the law, modern law of motion is that something will continue in motion until some contrary force uh, puts a stop to it. What has that got to do with whether you believe in God or not? It obviously didn't have anything to do with, with uh, Galileo or Kepler or Newton believing in God. Another one is the law of gravity. What does that got to do with whether you believe in God or not? In other words, you add all of these discoveries of modern science together and you do not come up with a sum that in any way has the tendency to prove or disprove the existence of God. Now, the guys who came up with them thought that they proved the existence of God. That's one, that's one step that most people have not... Uh, uh, do not uh, associate themselves with anymore. But from uh, from uh, Newton's perspective and Galileo's perspective, the wonder of the heavens, and from Kepler's, the wonders of the heavens and the obvious uh, signs of design actually prove the existence of God. Yes? I guess what I'm saying is, though, it seems like each of these discoveries sort of could be viewed as removing God from yeah. nature in a sense. You know, in that, in that, you know, the planets revolve around by these natural laws no longer because God wanted it to or, you know, or whatever, or, or made them go around. And it seemed like each discovery led to the possibility of removing God from That's nature. Right. And eventually, once you've got them se completely separated, it seems like yeah. it's not that big of a step to then say, well, you know, That's right. who needs God? That's what I mean by psychological. In other words, uh, 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 there's no doubt, that's what Stace is going to, is saying, and that's what we're going to talk about next time. There's no doubt that, there, that we went in the 18th century from an age of belief, I mean intense belief, such as with Galileo and Kepler, and uh, to, a, to an age of unbelief. And what all Stace is saying is, what brought that about? It obviously wasn't anything that they discovered. It was the psychological reaction to what they discovered. So in that sense, you're correct. God seemed to be more and more remote. But that's because God came to be viewed as the God of the gaps. And God was not the God of the gaps to, Arist to uh, Thomas Aquinas. God was not the God of the gaps to, uh, to uh, uh, Newton. He became the God of the gaps only to people following these people. And uh, and so uh, unless we just compl unless we just posit the idea that Galileo and Newton and so forth were irrational people, illogical people, and uh, that's hard to do since uh, since Newton Newton considered himself to be the major foe of irrationalism. If we posit these people to be illogical people, that's the only way we can. Uh, uh, that's the only way we can uh, say that uh, what they discovered, since I, I just kind of assume that Newton knew more about what he discovered than anybody else. And if he knew more about what he discovered than anybody else, and it didn't lead him in the slightest degree to doubt the existence of God, then if somebody accepts what Newton believed, or what Newton discovered, and and that leads him to doubt the existence of God, then there must be something else there besides logic. It must be a psychological. And psychologically, there is no doubt that God becomes more remote and more remote. Deism is the result of a psychological reaction to the rise of modern science.
Some of the most intelligent scientific people in the world are not deists. They are theists, and they believe that God created the world and that he's still in control of the world. And so, uh, psychologically, uh, the discoveries of modern science have had the opposite effect on them than it has on people who doubt the existence of God. Now, any good methodological naturalist worth his salt uh, will finally say that there's nothing in science that disproves the existence of God. I mean, go, that's what Gould says. So, so Gould and, uh, and a theologian would not disagree on that. The only thing I'm saying is that Gould, uh, that either Gould or the theologian are overreaching their bounds because, because Gould wants to define what a theologian can believe about God. And uh, sometimes a theologian uh, oversteps his bound by saying, telling Gould what he can believe about nature. And that's where the conflict still exists. But the conflict still today is not between intelligent people who are scientific and don't believe in God and unintelligent people who are non-scientific and still believe in God. That's not the debate. Yes? It seems to me by listening to it, you know, you're talking about a psychological way. It's almost as if they themselves feel like they've become their own gods of their own universe. What kind of thought do they Well, have? now that's a theological judgment, and I, it may be right. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's quite an appropriate uh, uh, judgment, uh, whether it's true or not. I would agree with you that, uh, that uh, I would put it in a different way, because that may be a little bit too theological. Uh, but what I would say is, for instance, I, I would agree with Paul Tillich, whose name I mentioned before, uh, who uh, uh, certainly in terms of intellect and uh, knowledge of history and philosophy and science, uh, I don't think had an equal in either theology or science. And, uh, and he was under the impression that uh, Carl Sagan... In fact, he dealt with a lot of people like Carl Sagan. I don't know if he dealt with Carl Sagan himself. But he was under the impression that Carl Sagan was not an atheist. That is, he could not be an atheist. Uh, because Carl Sagan believes in God. He just believes that nature is God. In other words, Carl Sagan, like everyone else, believes that human beings and other, everything else had to come out of something, not nothing. Tillich said that the essence of philosophy is the ex exploration of the question, why is there something and not nothing? Okay, so a theologian is doing that. He's, a, he's trying to deal with the question, why is there something and not nothing? But then so is an atheistic scientist trying to do that. He's trying to figure out why there is something and not nothing. So in a sense... Uh, the distinction between atheist and, and theist kind of falls apart from Tillich's perspective. Uh, in fact, uh, you might say that uh, Sagan's theology is probably an older theology than Christian theology because it's more similar to, uh, say, Babylonian mythology than it is to, uh, to Christian theology. Our, uh, Sagan even compared his theology more to Hindu theology. And so... Uh, you can't get away from being a theologian, is what Tillich is saying. And, uh, uh, and I, I don't think that... Uh, I think probably Sagan understood that better than Gould does. Because Gould kind of thinks that you can, get, you can get completely away from theology. And he won't say what his theological position is. You just have to... Uh, you just have to discern it from you know, the accumulation of all of his writings. But he says he tends to be, he tends to be atheistic, but he's uh, basically agnostic, which is a, which is a reasonable position. In other words, there's nothing un unreasonable about being an agnostic, because certainly all of the empirical, uh, empirically verified knowledge uh, 
uh, would lead us to be agnostic about God. It's just that theologians believe that there are other knowledge besides that which is empirically verifiable. Any other questions? Yes. I wanted to say that uh, after reading in religion and science with the comparison and similarities that uh, you, you come to this uh, macroism of, of a continual conflict between the two areas and, and it seems like we're reading this, I'm sure we just keep going constantly in a circle of, of various assertions when both of them really gleam from, from both fields to, to prove their point. And, and how, how, how do those, you know, how, how are they going to reconcile the fact that they're having to inject other aspects of, of, of their opponent's uh, uh, ideas? Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the conclusions that I've come to that uh, you don't have to come to in order to make an A in this course, but one of the conclusions I've come to is that, is that uh, uh, this is an area in which, uh, in which clarity of thought is extremely difficult because it is uh, probably the most emotional uh, area of the study of knowledge or, you know, epistemology. Is what, uh, what can you know about God? Can you know anything about God? Can you know anything that that uh, that uh, justifies somebody being a religious person. And they're just people who disagree about that. Gould disagrees about that. He, he doesn't believe that there's any real knowledge uh, that would justify a person being religious. But he thinks that it's all right to be religious if you just, if you just isolate it to emotions and maybe moral values. In other words, that, in that way he's a con Kantian. If you just isolate religion to moral value, theology to moral values and emotions, then it's a legitimate thing. But once it says anything about the nature of reality, then it becomes illegitimate. So this is a very emotional thing. And uh, 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 a while back I was at a seminar at Baylor University in which uh, uh, there were several people who were advocates of the, of the new doctrine of, cre of, uh, of uh, uh, creationism, which is uh, basically an argument from design. They don't consider themselves creationists because they don't base any of their arguments on the Bible or on theology. They claim to be scientists who are just basing their arguments on, on their scientific study. But there, there were some uh, Nobel laureate scientists who were also at this conference. And boy, I never saw such an emotional reaction than these guys had to these creationists. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it didn't really surprise me, but then again, it did surprise me as to how emotional it was. And uh, because they, they didn't really prepare speeches to answer these uh, new creationists. And I would have probably agreed with their speeches if they'd have prepared them. But they didn't really prepare speeches. What they did was just bad mouth religion. And they assumed that this was just totally a religious enterprise, so they just bad mouthed religion. And uh, and one of them told why he wasn't religious. Well, that's an interesting thing. I I really enjoyed hearing that because uh, I enjoy hearing why somebody's not religious. But that was certainly wasn't a scientific argument against the new creationists, just to say why you are not religious. He wasn't religious because of the Holocaust and because of the, uh, the Spanish Inquisition and because of the uh, medieval persecution of the Jews and nothing that religion has ever done has been positive and religion is just the worst thing that ever existed and the sooner we can get rid of it, the better. Now that was an interesting scientific uh, speech. <laughs> and uh, uh, and, and as I say, I, I enjoyed hearing it because uh, it does indicate the, the great emotion that, that, is, that surrounds this issue. And one of these days, this guy, or at least somebody related to him, is going to have to actually deal with the arguments that these younger scientists are bringing up. They can't just call them creationists and, uh, and dismiss them. And uh, if they do that, as I say, I will probably agree with the Nobel laureates. <laughs>
that this is probably not a true, in, true scientific endeavor that they're involved in. It's still a philosophical or theological endeavor. Just like I would agree that when, uh, when, uh, when Kepler makes his theological doxology and Newton makes his theological doxology, we're, we're dealing there with theology. And I think it's, it may be quite appropriate for Laplace later to write a book on science who, who does not mention God. In fact, that's what, Laplace was the first person to write a book on science that did not mention God. And so Napoleon uh, read the book and called Laplace in and said, uh, how in the world can you write a book of science without mentioning God? And what was Laplace's answer? Any of you remember? I have no need for that hypothesis. In other words, that is a, that is a pure statement of methodological naturalism. I do not need to mention God to understand anything about nature. Well, uh, that may be true scientifically. That is not true theologically from the perspective of a theologian. If God is the creator of nature, and if nature would go up into a puff of smoke if God did not exist or if God decided for it to, then God does have something to do with nature. But it is not that's not in the field of science. That's in the field of something else. And when, when Carl Sagan makes his theological statements, that's not in the field of science. That's in somebody else's field. I don't know whether Gould would tell him to get out of that field or not. Will we be reading any of the information of these design uh, Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at some of them. Uh, there's a spate of books that's been put out just recently by them. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just mention one or two of them. One of them is by Michael Behe, in case you want to go out and buy them because they're hot off the press. Behe. His is called Darwin's Black Box. Now, uh, he is not a traditional creationist. He is a Christian, but he's not a traditional creationist. He is a scientist, and, uh, and so he has written a book which has uh, really thrown uh, people into a tizzy. Uh, he is, he's been a great encouragement to the old-style creationists, even though he's not one of them. But he's also uh, been a thorn in the flesh to to uh, anti-creationists. You know, there's a there's a, there's been a kind of a, uh, a uh, uh, enterprise or a business of anti-creationism the last few years because of the threat to uh, to our school system that creationism may uh, somehow creep in. So he has written a book called Darwin's Black Box which doesn't use any of the old creationist arguments. He's using arguments from design from his own field of science. Uh, another, uh, uh, another guy that you might look up, Dembski, S-D-E-M-S-K-I, I think is the way, maybe there's a P there. Dembski. Anyway, look up uh, Amazon and you can find several books by him. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll reproduce some, uh, some uh, essays by these people. But uh, they are very careful not to introduce God into science or to introduce the Bible into science. And that just uh, drives some scientists up the wall because they want them to introduce God or introduce the Bible so they can call them creationists. The problem is they're not introducing God into science. What they're trying to do is the same thing that, uh, that uh, William Paley did in a certain way, except in a more sophisticated way, and that is to find God in nature, find design in nature. So we, we will deal with these folks to a certain extent. But that's the debate that's going on right now. That, that, that's the debate that was in the Houston Chronicle for weeks uh, after this Baylor conference. Because uh, Baylor scientists 
they, Baylor scientists despise Dembski and Behe because <laughs> they've appeared on uh, Baylor campus and uh, seem to be putting, giving Baylor science a bad name. Now, one of the things I've learned from reading some of their comments is that they've never read Behe and Dembski, and it might be good for them to read them. And they still may disagree with them, as I do, but they wouldn't be so, uh, so supercilious in their judgment of them. Okay, next time we will...